Great. Perfect. So I think maybe what we could do is, uh, you know, let's get started in the interests of time. Uh, so welcome everyone to the Connect and to today's uh, panel discussion. Uh, super excited to be here and uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, it's going to be a session which is packed with a lot of value. In most of it by engaging with all the speakers today. We're going to be covering a hot topic today, which is all about how to comply with KYC AML requirements in the UAE, particularly in view of the recent circular, you know, requiring all real estate brokers and agents, law firms, audited, audit, auditing firms, corporate services providers, and dealers of precious metals to register with the Go AML platform from uh, by the 31st of March, 2021. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background before we delve into the topic, uh, this, this event is conducted as part of the Connected Insights Web Summit. Uh, please do check out our website. There are a lot, many other events which might just be uh, of interest to you. Great, so uh, a little bit about myself before we begin. Uh, my name is Priya Shakori and I am a co-founder and partner at Connected Law. We're a new age law firm and what we do is we connect clients with senior lawyers and boutique firms with the relevant expertise. So I'm gonna keep my introduction really short because I know that one hour can pass by really quickly. So I wanna make sure that uh, you know we cover all uh, all the key questions during the course of today's session and we, are, we also uh, are able to engage with you. So uh, I'm really excited to be uh, presenting uh, today's panel of distinguished speakers. Um, uh, they're all experts in, uh, in, in their field. So we're gonna have a very insightful discussion. Uh, we have Deepak Bhavnani from Alia Consulting, Zaid Maniar from Crow UAE, Mariana from Bismosis and Ahmad from Al Nagar and Partners. So maybe what we could do is we could do a quick round of introduction uh, from all the panelists because I'm really bad at introductions and I'm sure we'd love to uh, hear better from the panelists themselves. Uh, so maybe we could uh, we could start with uh, Mariana. Ladies first. <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction, Priyasha, and thank you, gentlemen, for accepting me to go first. Um, pleasure to be attending today's uh, discussion. Um, my name is Mariana Bulbuk. I am the CEO and uh, managing partner of Bismosis Group. Um, today I represent Bismosis Business Services, a part of uh, our group, which is a um, government affairs agency. We specialize in tailored business solutions through the relationship that we have developed in over a decade with the UAE authorities um, at federal and local level in each Emirates. Um, I personally am passionate about business and business to government relations since a uh, young age and have worked in uh, a few European and the Middle Eastern government uh, or business to government relations uh, diplomatic environments. Um, and Bismosis is actually that platform that connects the, the businesses to the UAE authorities and not only worldwide through diplomatic missions to other markets where we can assist with either special approvals, exemptions, modification of um, requirements, uh, permits, licensing, um, and any other business and corporate uh, services required um, for the clients that approach us at any level from startups to multinationals. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, thanks a lot. And maybe we can move on to Deepak. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for your time. Um, my name is Deepak Bhagnani. I'm the CEO of Alia Consulting, which I founded 17 years ago in India. Uh, I've been in this industry for 33 years, uh, doing white collar crime investigations, international frauds, uh, pre transactional integrity due diligence, and, and a whole host of asset discovery and other uh, litigation support services with law firms, both domestically and internationally. Um, I'm, I will be uh, chipping in to the panel about certain KYC and AML work that we've been doing for the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years in India uh, for about 50 countries uh, around the world, including the GCC countries. Uh, so I look forward to uh, chatting with you more. Thanks. Thanks, Deepak. Uh, Zaid, you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to have you all here. Um, a partner at Chrome. 
and Crow is a leading firm, global top 10 of auditors and business advisors. And we have in the UAE 20 partners and directors and 200 colleagues. So look forward to working with you all and sharing some insight and more importantly, gaining some insight. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Ahmed, over to you. Yes, good morning, everybody. This is uh, Ahmed Nagar. I'm the managing partner of uh, Nagar and Partners. We are a very small, maybe smaller than everybody in the room, uh, law firm. Uh, we have uh, an office in Cairo, an office in Abu Dhabi, and another one in Dubai, specialized in legal consultancy, general. And here in the UAE, I've been practicing more than 12 years. I've seen a lot of changes in the laws and a lot of uh, changes in the style of life as well in the UAE that make uh, business go differently. And uh, that's our strength that we advise um, our clients how to do business here and how to live as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Hemad, and thank you everyone for the lovely introduction. So I think now we're ready to jump into the meat of the discussion. Now, before we really delve into the details, I thought it would just be useful to start with the basics. And so uh, maybe I have a question for Deepak in terms of maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what really is KYC AML and, and you know, uh, why is it not just for banks and financial institutions? Because traditionally I've always associated AML KYC with banks. Of course, lawyers were regulated. We also do have to conduct KYC, but uh, you know, the, the breadth of KYC seems to have been increasing over the last few years. That's true. Thanks, Piyasha. So, um, yeah, and you're right, there's, there's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of terms. It all starts with, you know, the FATF and the FIU, which is the Financial Action Task Force and the financial intelligence units, which each country have. Uh, there's some global organizations that have uh, put together, let's say, certain requirements that because each country has its own laws, they have to respect that. So, so there is a there's a sort of uh, open-ended uh, information given about what they need to know about anti-money laundering and uh, the K KYC side of uh, uh, you know the the research and the checks that need to be done. So it's not, there's no hard and fast checklist that's available um, anywhere in the world. Uh, I've looked at that for, for quite a while and, and there, there is nothing there. So, so you, it is open to adapting to what your uh, uh, country systems are and what information is available. So let me, let me start with uh, the simplest kind of thing. So, so the concept of course is um, because of the cross-border and global trading and business relationships, um, governments have come together to fight uh, primarily on what they call the, uh, the counter-terrorism uh, um, uh, payments and, and checking for that. They, they've requested that, uh, and as you rightly pointed out, with all the banks and the financial institutions saying, you need to do KYC and AML checks on everyone you do business with around the world so that we, we want to know whether there's any issues of concern. So it actually started, and we, we were looking at this uh, almost a decade ago, was, was doing studies of correspondent banks for financial institutions, uh, because at that time it was any funds touching America, they need to have a KYC check on it. So the correspondent bank checks were being done at that time. That, of course, then increased to the bigger corporations and the, and the deals. And, and you're right, and, and as time has passed more and more, uh, there is a requirement being extended to companies to say, to, to normal professional companies also saying, anything that you see as a suspicious transaction, you need to report it. Uh, and I know uh, I'll leave that to you to talk about a bit more about the Go AML side of things and the suspicion, suspicious transaction reporting system. But coming back to what is, the levels of uh, the requirements, and I'll, I'll chat about them a, a bit later also, but you, you start with a basic, what's called an AML check, which is which people normally default to saying, I'll do a Google search, uh, and others will do uh, combine that with doing a, a world check kind of system, um, and, and say, okay, we, we're done. Um, then the next level up is what, what they call a KYC, uh, and this is again, uh, there is a difference about saying, uh, the compliance side and everything, and I know some of uh, our, uh, you know, our co-panelists here uh, have 
experience, extreme, uh, amazing experience about dealing with international compliance requirements for having the information. But then the next step, of course, is to check that independently. And that's where the KYC bit comes in, is based on the identifiers provided, how far do you want to go? So a KYC check will also include doing sanctions checks, regulatory checks, uh, bankruptcy checks, and things like that. So, so there's a next level up. Um, and, and we've, of course, uh, you know, called it the Amana process, which is the, uh, you know, integrity and, and the background checks. And there's a, then they, on top of that, you've got an enhanced uh, Amana check, which is checking the company or the people associated uh, with, with the main subject to make sure that they don't have any connections. They're not a proxy. They're not a, a front person. Uh, and, and, and sort of giving information that could then be of concern to you. Now, uh, there, there are more and more levels, but we, we can talk about those separately. We'll, we'll stick to these today. But what I do, do want to say is that it, it's important to at least have some structure in place because the reason for doing it is twofold. One is compliance. Uh, because you do need to respect the laws of your country and, and meet those requirements. And the second, of course, is that uh, if you don't do it, there are two issues that happen. One, you get involved in, in, uh, in a sort of listing somewhere in the media that your organization was not compliant and therefore has a negative impact on the reputation. And, and the last part of it, of course, um, is you could get fined by the regulator. And those fines could be so phenomenal that it just isn't worth not spending that money on doing the AML and KYC checks. No, no, so, so I'd leave it at that and, and pass it on to my esteemed colleagues to, to discuss. Yeah, so I think on this note, uh, Zed, uh, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about why KYC AML should not be limited to just banks. You, you know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit of a uh, little bit there in terms of your perspectives from an accounting and auditing firm. Sure, thank thank you for that, Priyasha. To understand that, what we really need to understand is why is all this happening. So as we know that uh, you know, the global population is increasing, people are living longer, more children are being born, which is wonderful. But all these people need medical attention, education, uh, support services, roads to drive on. And this money has to come from somewhere. Now, largely this money comes from government revenues. And in most countries, government revenues are taxation. So the OECD back uh, in Paris in 1989 had decided that countries need to work together to avoid tax evasion. Now tax evasion, money laundering, these all go in hand to hand. Earlier, the definition of money laundering, which we saw in movies, was illicit gains of smuggling and other kinds of contraband trading. That is not the only definition. So why are lawyers, auditors, accountants, even real estate companies? That's because we are the gatekeepers for money entering an economy. We help people form companies. We help people liaise with governments. We help people draft contracts. We help people have an address here in the UAE. So these, we all need to work together to ensure that the funds being brought in, we have reasonably done need to perform reasonable AML checks, which go beyond what my colleague Deepak said. So, and friends, don't think that this is just a UAE thing. No. OECD has many members uh, and UAE is part of the MENA FATF uh, convention. And so, and you have other countries. We saw our colleague Heather, she's from the Netherlands, the Netherlands, Singapore, Hong Kong, all the and, uh, countries or business hubs where you have inflow of FDI, uh, then these are the countries that ought to ramp up compliance. So it's it's a delight to see the UAE making strides. I hope that answered your question, Priyasha. No, I think that's very clear. You know, I mean, just as you mentioned, we're the gatekeepers. 
uh, to the UAE or to any country for that matter. So it's important that we make sure that the money that's coming in is clean money. Uh, on that note, um, you know, I think it would be amazing to just get a little bit of insights into why the UAE government has recently been taking so many steps and would be would love to hear from Mariana because Mariana is a UAE, uh, is a UAE government affairs expert. She deals with the government all the time. So would love to know, have the inside information on, you know, why all of this is happening, you know, quite, I mean, so, so I mean, over the last couple of years in the UAE. Thank you, Priyasha. Uh, yes, it's very important to understand why the change is coming, because I think a lot of businesses build up frustration that in the recent, let's say, year, despite the whole COVID challenges, a lot of new announcements come regarding meeting specific regulations or requirements. So I think it is a, they see it as a burden. And it's important to understand why that burden is important. It is important for them, first of all, as businesses, not just to the country. So let's take it on a broader uh, picture. First of all, UAE. Uh, prides itself as one of the best countries in the world, the safest, the, the, the most reputable, and works really hard. And we can see the UAE's uh, efforts being um, uh, felt inside and outside the country in the last 10 years. First of all, because of the great diplomatic relationships that they do, um, their, their, their um, uh, respect of investors that come from the UAE around the globe, residents of the UAE have benefits of, of travel and and, and residency and business travel visas and access to other markets uh, so easily, not just in the GCC. So when we speak about UAE uh, increasing its standards in all to do legal framework, including, of course, of the KYC and um, AML uh, rules and regulations, that increases the, the image and the brand that the UAE is promoting worldwide as being transparent, reliable, correct, fair. Um, mostly because in the past we know that the UAE has been challenged by other authorities as being maybe not as transparent or maybe nurturing specific uh, industries or, or incomes or, or funds that uh, some other jurisdictions have stated as, uh, let's say, non-reliable. So UAE now is proving to the world that it is not just a movement, it's imperative, it's needed, it's fast, it's implemented, and it is um, executed upon, right? So they take not just words, but actions, immediate actions. And they have declared that they are deeply committed. UAE government and the federal authorities and local authorities are deeply committed in combating the money laundering locally and obviously through the UAE internationally in also uh, limiting and controlling and restricting financial of, or financing of um, terrorism or illegal organizations worldwide. And, and we can see that the, the amendment or the updates in regards to know your customers, so the, the whole background of investors and the source of funds, as well as transparency and, um, uh, let's say, uh, correctiveness of, of where the man, money are coming from or the goods, because we know there's a lot of black market around the world with regulated goods as well, such as gold or precious stones. So the UAE now has committed to meet those international standards uh, aligned with United Asian Nations, World Bank instructions, international, international Monetary Fund, and many, many other authorities that work together. So UAE now is becoming a part of that international team of controlling those funds, controlling the source of, of the funds, controlling the individuals behind those sources. And even though the businesses in the UAE see it as, oh, I don't need it, why do I have to declare it? They have my license, they have the copy of my passport, I don't care, they can see everything. However, by our companies or the UAE companies becoming part of this movement and part of these changes, they will start implementing those standards and those uh, routines or SOPs, if we call them, standard operating procedures in regards to making sure that the source of their produce or raw materials is correct, the source of the funding is correct, that the clients or suppliers, there's not only the client, the supplier can be one, that is non-reliable as well, are reliable, are correct, and are transparent. And this way, we are lifting the country. So UAE is becoming more transparent, more trustworthy, residents of the UAE, respectively, and businesses coming from the UAE, wider, easier, broader, accepted worldwide. Um, and it is a benefit that will go along the whole chain, right, of, of businesses and individuals, rather than just directed and put in the rule and uh, making it uh, a difficulty, it will be an improvement to all of us 
Uh, and I hope as soon as possible, companies will, um, will see this as a benefit to their own, not just to the country, and participate into being transparent and making the right efforts to contribute to uh, improvement of what the UAE is bringing forward. No, thanks a lot, Mariana, for the big picture. It gives us, uh, you know, gives us the good, uh, sets the right context for all of us. Uh, on this note, maybe, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from Ahmed on the nitty gritties, you know, because the last couple of years, the UAE has issued various regulations on AML and KYC. So maybe you could, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about uh, all, all, the, all the regulations and including the latest circle and the implications of it. Yes, uh, thank you. I'll uh, handle the boring part, the, the laws and the decrees and all these uh, numbers. So I'll, um, I'll try to be very short because then I give a little bit of uh, a comment on these laws. So the UAE have issued a set of laws to uh, combat financial terrorism and uh, to, to for anti-money laundry rules. So we look at the decree law number 20 of 2018, the cabinet resolution number 10 of 2019 regarding the anti-money laundry and combating financial terrorism, ministerial decree number 100 of 2020 for the, the ESR, the economic substance regulations. We see as well the cabinet resolution number 58 of 2020 for, regarding the ultimate beneficial owners. The UAE have issued set of guidelines for uh, DNFBPs, the designated non-financial uh, business and professions, to guide us as professionals how to do um, our business and how to, to handle the, all this um, liability and responsibility on us to check really our clients. I'll tell you very, um, a very old story. I remember when I started uh, my business, I started working in the UAE, it was 2008, and I was in a corporate structures uh, division in the law firm. I remember going to Jabal Ali Free Zone to go establish an offshore company. And uh, by that time, all what I needed for my client was his passport copy. That's it. And later on, six months uh, down the line, they started to request for a bank reference letter, but an original one that was very important. So even the authority itself have developed throughout the years, the requirements very much. As I was working for a multinational firm, we had our own internal due diligence and KYC regulations, which was a bit higher than the government at that time. So we were asking for a passport copy, clear and colored and recent, a CV, a utility bill as a proof of address and a bank reference letter or a bank statement. And with these four set of documents, we review them, we look at them very well, and we think that we did the, our due diligence correctly. We put them in the file, we give the authority whatever they like, they need as a requirement to establish the company, and everything is done. So I saw a difference between how Jabal Ali have been treating their files, how Russell Khayma was treating the files, was treating it a little bit more uh, strict than Jabal Ali at that time, and then it switched that Rasa Khema became more relaxed and Jabal Ali became more efficient. And then DIFC was like, whoa, the, the, the highest uh, authority that is asking for a huge uh, KYC and due diligence. And then you learn that it depends who is putting the rules at that time. So it was every independent free zone doing their own set of laws and set of regulations or requirements to do their own due diligence. And then the UAE have wrapped up all this and they organized it and they put it in place. Right now, all and every free zone and all and every authority will ask, not all, sorry, most of them will follow a very similar criteria because everybody now is regulated and everybody now have to do their own due diligence to cover um, or to do part of the work that the government should do. And then we present all the documents ready for the government to do their own due diligence on the clients to accept them. Of course, my colleagues have explained why and why is it very important right now to do this, to, to protect the community, to protect the business environment in the UAE. And I repeat that it, it is our own obligation, 
our own uh, responsibility to do that. Um, I know a lot who don't ask their clients, where is this money coming from? What is the purpose of this company? They just do the job. However, it is really our obligation and it is very important for every single professional to do that, to protect his own business, not just the community and all the uh, general talk, but also protecting your own business towards um, such fines, because now you are responsible, now you are um, obliged by the government to do your own checkup. No, thanks a lot, Ahmad, for, you know, the brief summary. It's always good to hear practical uh, examples, you know, of how, how all of these play out. Uh, so maybe what we could do is uh, we can talk a little bit about the different kinds of KYC AML checks, because I know that there's no one size fit all approach, you know, for example, you might have a really small client and, you know, there's no point doing a really in-depth, uh, you know, KYC on them for a very small value matter. Uh, so how do we decide the level of AML checks to be done? So maybe this, uh, this question I'll probably ask Deepak, what are the different kinds of checks and how do we decide what to apply for which case? Sure. So Priyasha, if you don't mind, I'll just share my screen uh, and sure, put sure. together, a, uh, it's literally a one page thing. So mm -hmm. bear with me and just let me know. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Excellent. Okay, so so as as our co-panelists mentioned, uh, you know you can't limit KYC just to banks and financial institutions. Uh, that may have been the case ten or fifteen years ago, uh, but there is a lot more that happens. A lot more business transactions that happen, uh, which need to be assessed to make sure that they are not against the country, against the the. Uh, you know, anything to do with terrorism or drugs or, or uh, anti-money laundering that has to be looked at. So I'll, I'll walk through uh, the, the Amansa services uh, and, and give you a sense of, from, from the work that we've been doing for the last 10, 15 years, uh, it's kind of fallen into, let's say, these three basic buckets. There's a lot more when you talk about a full due diligence, and, and that probably needs a separate session. Uh, but just for the purposes of this, of what what should a GCC country uh, professional services entity be doing at a bare minimum? Ideally, externally, if they don't have their own team. So if you have your own compliance team, the first part of this, which is the AML checks, is, is actually uh, fairly straightforward and easy to do. If you've got a person who's semi-trained, semi-aware, they, they can do this for you. So, so you, you take the name, you run uh, a Google search, uh, you do a bit of the international sanctions checks, and then World Check or others will tell you whether they whether they are connected as a politically exposed person, and that would largely be as if they are directly a politically exposed person. Now there are we, for example, we have an uh, access to a proprietary database and information that we you know collated over the last seventeen years, which allows us to go back to our repository, uh, go into these databases, which do using almost 300 different keywords like, you know, fraud and um, anti-money laundering and, and scams and, uh, you know, tax and, and, and words like that to, to then do a proper uh, Google search, if you want to call it that, although we've got databases that do a, a red flag aggregation for us also. Um, now, it takes a lot of time. You can do. You can say, okay, I looked at the first two pages of Google, um, and and I and I did a world check, and and my job's done. Maybe it might work. Uh, is it a bare minimum that one should be doing? Absolutely. Um, you know, you can't get away from a a search uh, engine check plus um, at least one world check type database, which you can do on your own, or uh, you can buy the database. You can build it up any way you want. Okay, um, so that's that's one, uh, which is like the bare minimum. Now that may not be sufficient, uh, uh, you know, in uh, as far as the regulators go, but it, it is something that you should do at least to know that you are not dealing with somebody who's very obviously uh, politically connected or involved in an, in an issue that could affect your reputation. So then, then comes the next level, which is the Amana checks. Um, so it's 
you have been given information by that potential client or business associate or uh, the person that as a as you as a professional services company are taking on board as a client so uh, so doing the the checks that i mentioned plus doing a brief independent profiling is very important verifying their address to say does it exist okay you may have had that on a on a passport or on a corporate filing uh, but that could have changed that may have been 5 years ago that may be the registered office of an accounting firm or a company formation agency not enough uh, you need to say do they where do they physically exist or are legally registered today um as opposed to the leads that and the information you've got from the documents provided then you 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 do need to look at them if if you're going to bring them on you do want to know if they have the ability to pay you so for that uh, doing a bankruptcy check and solvency check is very important uh, and those are done in country um anything to do with regulatory bodies from the stock exchanges to the so so obviously the us sec filings are famous but then you've got different government bodies and authorities that are compiling information putting them out uh, either um, you know in their own databases but you may not necessarily get access to them during a, a standard uh, google search because just just for the audience to know my my understanding is that there's probably 60 billion plus pages on on the internet today um and google search may cover maybe 18 to 20 billion only so there's you're only checking one third of uh, the the work that you need to do on average if you just do a google search so so the next level comes is you have to go to specific places and do those checks uh, and that's what we do into a, a sort of amana check which is uh, which is you know more of your uh, a sort of formal kyc check uh, to to call it that and of course you don't want to be dealing with somebody who's got a criminal past also now so these are so coming just to give you a top line on these two i i appreciate there are time constraints there are budgetary constraints there are you know what is the value of this client why should i spend this time and effort in doing this kind of check uh, but you do need to do it for the reasons we all mentioned earlier is that you you know you don't want your firm to be in a naming shaming situation where there's a public list saying these guys have you know been doing dealing with the enemy as it were um mm-hmm. and 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 that could affect your reputation because if somebody then did the search on you as a as a business or as an individual and they find you were involved in in dealing with the wrong kind of people they won't deal with you they'll go to your competition so no, so for your own business business growth you need to do that right and yeah, lastly, but what about for sorry uh, just to sorry to interrupt you but what about for like small value matters you know because a lot of times there are let's say there's a you know freelancer who just wants to set up a company you know what what sort of a check do we do on such a person you know they let's say they want to set up a, like a really basic e-commerce company the risk seems low so what do we do mm-hmm. in that case yeah so so again as as would happen is that if uh, for an let's take an e-commerce company they they would be given some information from the person who wants to use their platform or engage with them um and you know i I've, i've actually seen payment uh, providers or service providers in the us who are actually involved in um in a lot of uh, fraudulent activity out of the us for example so you'd think okay here we go with we're, we're dealing with a well known name or something but they're actually connected in such a way that they're doing e-commerce fraud and they've been uh, looked at by the fda in the us uh, for uh, non compliance and and selling uh, selling products and services that are out of line so so the minimum requirement would still be to do an amana check to validate uh, are you dealing with somebody who really does exist or are they fly by night operators who just come set up the business and uh you know make their money and leave um and 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 you're left with dealing with that problem of your reputation being affected mm. because somebody used your platform um uh, for a short period of time no i understand right yes if i may add here sure, um sure. See, it doesn't matter if the job is small or big i mean what stops a person who has big money in the background to come and tell you that he wants a small job for the beginning 
right? I mean, yeah. the people who are in these channels of money laundering, we can't judge them, you know, by color, nationality, or the amount of investments. And it is our moral value above everything, despite, you know, making it scary, and yes, you can be linked to them, that is very dangerous, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you're contributing to assisting the crime, even if willingly or unwillingly, just by not taking any action, okay? So if you do nothing, you have helped that person to bring or move or increase or damage a third party by bringing money laundry or, or uh, illegal goods through the UAE or through you. So you've contributed to that crime. Now, as, as uh, Deepak is explaining, Mr. Deepak is explaining, do at least a basic check. Nothing stops you to do a basic check. Spend 30 minutes, go through Google, translate it in the language of the country. If in English you have no research, no, no feedback, go Google Translate. Translate the name, translate the activity, translate the passport details, put it there, see if something comes in. But above everything, you need to have a procedure in place. Have an application form, right? Like the banks have it. At least if something really happens and you are dragged along to the, the situation, you have done your best at that or within your possibilities and you have proof to it that the, that the applicant or the client has uh, completed a form under their liability have declared that they are not part of money laundering, that they are sources or whatever, they're not involved in any crime. So at least you have done something. You have that portfolio of efforts to prove to the local authorities and to whoever approaches you later on for a comment by contributing to that, that you have done at least at the surface an effort of finding information and, the, and you have gone with the client's declarations because when you apply for a visa it's the same right i at the end sign that whatever i declare and documents i provide are not fake and it's my liability so at least to have that form completed by the client and the basic check is already doing something doing nothing means contributing to it from my perspective even though it may be a bit radicalist but i think 30 minutes uh, of effort can save uh, someone's, uh, you know, um, income from from being cheated by by someone that is not transparent or not relevant. So it's our duty, individual duty, to do that above just the business. No, thanks, Mariana. Really insightful. I guess the takeaway is that no matter what the value is, we really need to do these checks. And I guess that's why the UAE has been taking, you know, all these stringent sort of imposing all these stringent regulations on, uh, on you know, these broad, uh, uh, these broad sort of service providers. Uh, Zed, I think you have a comment there. I can see you ra raising your hands. Yes, I did. I just wanted to add to my colleagues, Mariana and Deepa, and, you know, those of us who are on the listening side, you, you really need to also think about, um, you know, not just placement. So this morning, what we have been talking about is placement of funds, somebody coming to form a company, somebody coming to settle in the UAE. That is the first point where they bring in maybe currency or denomination. But what you importantly also need to think about and these are defined by the IFAC, which is the International Federation of Accountants and our uh, ethics board is about layering and integration. And this is where uh, lawyers or advisors often can get caught out because you may be uh, drafting somebody an agreement to make an investment, to make a transfer of shares. So here you need to think about that what sort of uh, activity could a launderer be doing to make sure that from the layering, they then go into integration, which is that they actually make this transaction, they transfer the shares, or they, as Mariana said, they take the visa, and now they are part of the ecosystem. So at that point, to take them out is, is more of a challenge, more of a task. So it's important that you ensure that you're not thinking about just placement of funds, but also layering, as well as integration of funds and activities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. In fact, yeah, uh, go ahead, Deepak, sorry. So I just I just wanted to add, you know, we, we've seen stories where, uh, you know, we found a normal sort of employee KYC, if you want to call it that, or uh, because they were in a sensitive role, we actually found that they had a criminal uh, record in Hong Kong. Uh, and th this was an employment issue in Hong Kong. We've looked at people who've come into, uh, uh, well, uh, more into Laos into uh, rather than Vietnam, it's, it's Laos. 
to set up set up businesses but then we found that you know one of these individuals actually had a a, a spine charge against them in the us um so so we we don't really know what to expect when we are doing uh, work on a international uh, you know uh, or, or that tenure that the person's had abroad uh, i think that's very important to to check which is where that e amana thing comes in is where you widen the search because mm. the relationship is getting bigger and this is the basic aml check then go on to an amana as your relationship so it's not like now i've connected with them they've just come on board let me just do a basic check and now i don't need to bother so i think it's important to kind of keep the the checks going as the relationship increases more people are brought in to add to that relationship or the the numbers start increasing it's important to do like a refresher check or a deeper check. so these these three options and just the last point on this is that we have used these options i i know one client that we worked with who's actually taken these reports given them to the regulator and been able to say look you want to find me and you're saying i have not done my kyc and due diligence checks here's a, a set of the reports and the effort we make every time what more do you want us to do what or what more do you think can be done under the bigger broader uh, rules and regulations and and we know for fact for a fact that part of the work that we were doing uh, with some international colleagues on on this kind of effort they were able to actually prove that they were doing what is reasonable and justifiable enough mm -hmm. so therefore they should not be fined and and it did not then come out in the public that they were fined or or negatively impacted uh, because of the fact that they done their checks and they had a full record of it No, no, makes a lot of sense, Deepak. I think this is all about insulating ourselves as well from regulatory actions, because as you mentioned, we're all gatekeepers. So if we don't do our job, then we, you know, expose ourselves to risks. And I think, uh, you know, this also brings about the importance of having, I guess, an MLRO in the organization, because, you know, there needs to be somebody who's looking into compliance and to all all of these checks. Uh, and i think ahmed el nagar maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, you know like a little bit a little bit about how law firms can comply as well because i know that the last year almost 200 law firms in the uae were suspended uh, and and ahmed maybe you can tell us a little bit about why they were suspended and and what law firms should do to comply with kyc ml yep um the authorities in the uae have sent to uh, through every relevant authority of course in each emirate have sent a, a communication to all law firms in the uae to identify a member of their team to be to act as the mlro to the money the money laundry reporting officer and to put in place uh procedures and regulations internal for each firm to combat the the money laundry and the, the terrorism financing okay only 200 firms did not even respond and those were the firms uh, suspended so they did not do something wrong they were just suspended because they did not respond to the authority so the authority have suspended 200 of them and uh within the time frame that was given uh, 193 did respond and seven did not and those seven uh, got fined got fined of 100,000 dirhams each so wow. it is uh, quite that's a hefty, yeah that's a big fine of course but it's just because i uh, assume that they did not understand what is mlro and because a lot of the firms a lot of law firms do not even have any internal regulations to uh, to 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 manage this part and or to do any due diligence or any even any, any conflict checking because all the traditional way of working with local uh, law firms they are just taking care of the day to day operation and litigation their agendas and they're not performing proper uh, conflict check even or any due diligence on their clients and a lot of them are involved in transactions that will expose them to escrow transactions and the company formation and they have to be very careful with uh, this uh, regard
So, you know, in light of that, do you think uh, law firms and legal consultancies are going to now uh, register on the Go AML platform? Because we do have a compliance deadline of 31st March, and it seems like many don't really know about, you know, a a KYC AML laws and compliance. So what do you think? I think they all, if any of them is, is exposed to, to providing any corporate structures advisory or or any transactions related to, to uh, trust services or uh, or any of the work that the corporate service providers are doing, which a lot of law firms are doing that, and a lot of legal consultancy firms are doing that as well, they all should. They have the obligation. Also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think the word needs to get around a bit more about how people can comply. Maybe on this note, Zed, if you can tell us a little bit about the goal platform and uh, you know what uh, you know what is the and and what really is the requirement because i think even auditors and auditing firms have to register yes thank you priyasha so basically go aml is just the uh, government's website where every entity first needs to get a clearance from the authority about who will be their mlro they will assess that person and they will ensure that, or they will at least verify if this person has the right capabilities, qualifications, and more importantly, authority. So simply by saying that, okay, my admin person who's also doing my uh, airline tickets booking will also do my Go AML, that may not be wholly appropriate. So this is very important and it goes back to the earlier point about size and resources. So simply by saying that if you are a single practitioner, uh, then I don't have the resources, uh, then that's not acceptable. It has to be addressed. And of course, uh, there is an opportunity here to work together with organizations, uh, perhaps uh, through or with uh, con uh, connected, and then uh, and Priyasha and their team, uh, Varun, so that all this work of yours can be done efficiently and effectively. But friends, also remember the registration process is like any other process. It's made, it's fairly uh, standard uh, mechanical in that you put in the information. But what is important is that you need to develop some healthy skepticism. And this goes back to what uh, Deepak was saying that when you do a search, what is driving your skepticism? Of course, at one end, you, sh you can think that every client of yours is uh, suspicious that you may be overdoing the work and in some instances you may think no none of my clients are suspicious you may be not exercising enough skepticism so it's very important that you develop a healthy professional skepticism and uh, understand uh, you know of course there will be instances or you can reach out to me we can go through examples about uh, what instances uh, trigger a suspicious activity uh, because the suspicion is not the same as what it used to be for money laundering. It's far more sophisticated and in countries uh, where there's a huge inflow of FDI, there is particularly a greater requirement for uh, a healthy dose of skepticism. So that how OAML is going to be linking and working through that system, they will be uh, contacting as uh, you know, Brother Ahmed just clarified that simply by not registering, they didn't do anything wrong, but they didn't even respond, you are sanctioned or you are fined. And the fines are hefty. Uh, Ahmed is practicing in ADGN, which is a very uh, fast growing and uh, dynamic uh, uh, free zone uh, financial market. So there the fines are very, very uh, significant. So, so it's important and these fines are not level wise that okay it's only for the big fish or etc it's whoever is doing the work so please be mindful but it's a great opportunity i believe uh, you know i always like to conclude my remarks with something positive the positive thing here is today uh, dubai Abu Dhabi, UAE is at the forefront of fdi uh, and having these opportunities means more work for us as consultants as lawyers as auditors so it's a great time to be in this space uh, and of course, it goes back to my first opening remarks that it's helping government regulate the flow of money. It's helping them uh, generate 
appropriate tax revenues in the appropriate jurisdiction. And that's all going back to you, your kids, your family in terms of healthcare, education, infrastructure. So thank you, friends, and thank you, Priyasha. No, thanks a lot, Zed, for you know the positive remarks. It's it's very good to put that in context. Uh, you know, because sometimes people look at all of this as a burden. So when you when we see the big picture, it's it, you know it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so Mariana, maybe you could tell us a little bit about again for corporate service providers. What are your you know remarks? Because I'm sure a lot of business agencies don't really have any compliance framework in place, and and are people even aware that you know they have to register on the platform by the end of this month? Uh, indeed, yes. Um, well, corporate service provider, as an explanation, obviously goes beyond just the licensing or structuring of the business, right? It goes through uh, any type of uh, residency, uh, transactions, bank account, personal, commercial assistance, um, permits for import, export of goods into the country, um, licensing, inspections by the government for specific uh, activities that are regulated. So. A company who is in the, this, let's say, PRO and licensing and corporate service providing uh, environment um, is, is uh, touching so many other aspects of the business rather than just the licensing. And in some stages, the clients come to you already while being registered by someone else. And this is where I see the biggest, um, let's say, second line of, of checkup that we could implement, which is not done for sure by many companies. So. One thing that we discuss is at the incipient stage where an investor comes to you and you have to advise them, set up a legal structure or residency for them, and it's for the first time they're touching you, your services and your brand. It is important, as we discussed earlier, to have those at least minimum checkups through the, through the uh, registration process. However, this doesn't mean that if the client comes to you already with an existing and running business, and asks for your service when you enroll that client, be it a residence visa or a dependent visa or a personal bank account assistance or, I don't know, um, rent a car or, or getting a property uh, rented for the family to relocate to the UAE. So in any layer of contact with your clients, it is our duty to go through that due diligence because it doesn't matter how early or late you engage the client, you still are liable for making sure that the client is meeting um, the rules and regulations of transparency, fairness and transactions, correct source of funds, transparent and uh, legal right UBOs, beneficiaries and investors, uh, family members, and so on and so forth. Now, I'll give you the simplest example here. We had one of the clients that came to us that had a company for, I think, about nine years in the UAE and requested us to, it probably is similar to, to uh, our colleague, uh, Mr. Deepak's example, requested us uh, for uh, assistance of one of the senior uh, hired uh, employees uh, at the um, chief executive position, uh, requested us to assist that person with the residency of himself and then family and then further bank account in the VIP services framework. So everything to be serviced without any disturbance to the employee that they're hiring. Obviously, we knew the company, we serviced uh, the company in other aspects and the owners, but we did the due diligence uh, of the uh, um, employee as well. And while doing the due diligence, we have uh, found out that the employee actually has changed uh, its name. Um, I'm not gonna say he or she, uh, two times in, in the past and uh, has been in worldwide search uh, in, uh, European jurisdiction under one name, in Asian jurisdiction under a second name, and with a third name and a third uh, passport uh, was enrolling into the UAE. So, and that was a simple search online. Uh, and also um, the search online was triggered by the application form. It is, we, we have a standard that we inquire our, our engaged um, uh, individuals to declare if they have owned uh, similar to visa again right any other passports or any other name in the past um female are most common to change names after marriage however in some instances male uh, applicants also have the name changed during the lifetime and then the person did not declare that however we found online that uh, uh, the name has been changed and that was the first trigger that we didn't feel comfortable about we found out that in the application form, the person declares that the name has never been changed and no other citizenship owned. However, online we have found, strangely, through social media platforms, Facebook and LinkedIn, the person did not yeah, think yeah. it probably, 
uh, we found that there was a similar person with similar pictures and similar uh, details. Uh, however, with a duplicate personality and, and name, and then digging further in and inquiring abroad into the authorities, we have found more details about it. Should we have not done this, then obviously it was nothing uh, complicated to get a residence visa yeah. for a person who already was accepted as a tourist and everything was uh, easy uh, and straightforward. However, we would have been then again com compliant, no, no, com complices, right, in English, yeah. so part of support yeah, exactly, that 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 said, yeah. To, exactly to be a resident and an operator and actually have a very big decision position decision making financial decision making position into a company that was hiring that employee and that uh, had a doubtful integrity right so that's from the now that's a great example great example mariana and i think this is uh, this is something that a lot of corporate service providers would have to keep, take a note of because you just never know where you could be exposing yourself to risks uh, I, we have a little bit of time left, so I'm, I'm going to take a quick question from one of our attendees, uh, and maybe this question I could probably ask Deepak, what are the risks relating to dealing with the PEPs? And maybe you could oh. explain PEPs a little sure. bit. Yeah. Sure. So, so it, but that's a good question, Priyasha, because see, uh, PEP, normally people just assume it's a, it's a CDR government official, and that's not actually what it is. Uh, so, so it says politically exposed as opposed to politician, right? Um, and this is this goes back to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when they were talking about people coming in with suitcases into uh, into Switzerland and opening bank accounts and keeping the money there. So, so you know, we've, we've got a whole host of historical stories. But having said that, uh, anybody that's a, a, a bureaucrat in the country, uh, a part of the civil services, uh, in the senior management of a government undertaking would all come under the category of a politically exposed person. So, so the important thing is one, you, uh, the basic check would just tell you whether they are politically exposed or not. Uh, but then the, the next, the levels up are where you come to know whether they are uh, just part of the government machinery of that country or is there something more to them? Uh, and that's that's where you are able to then figure out whether there is a negative impact. Obviously, dealing with a civil servant, a bureaucrat, a politician is is not a bad thing. It's it's about it's whether they are doing something that is not in the best interest of their own country. That would then be then you could be seen as complicit in in supporting them internationally in something that they are doing negatively in country. So it, so the risk so there is. There's, there's, there's normal sort of business associations, and then there is a, a potential for concern where the person or the country is known for smuggling or money laundering or having been given government aid uh, from the bigger sovereign agencies. And then there's still not enough growth and, and issues and scandals that have kept coming up. So I think that's, that's where the importance comes is you need to do that extra check if you know that they are a PEP to understand whether that's potentially negative or not. So, so it's, a, it's a layered first flag. Are they politically exposed or not? If they're not, fine. If they are, you need to do more. I, I think that's where the, the, the flagging comes up as, a, uh, as an important aspect to check. Yeah, and I think Ahmad, you uh, you uh, you just you just raised your hand. Anything to add there? Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to add a few things, but but then Deepak have covered them because I wanted okay. to say that, for example, even the families of politically mm -hmm. exposed persons, like a son or a wife or a daughter, will be exposed as well and will be mentioned. I mean, you have to do uh, enhanced due diligence on the same people as well. I personally handle a, a few uh, PEPs uh, within my uh, um, company as uh, pro pro providing them with service. So as long as the enhanced due diligence is, is accessible and is done in the right way, banks, authorities, and everybody accept these kind of clients. There is absolutely no problem to deal with them. It's actually a very good thing when you deal with someone who is an ex-minister or ex-president of this country. It's just that the source of funds have to be studied very well 
from your side and you have to make sure that he is not doing anything wrong as just the back said. So this is something I want to say in the middle of the conversation, but he, he did complete it already. So Got it, perfect. So just a quick roundup before we conclude the webinar. Are there any other questions from the attendees? I'm conscious, uh, you know, that we've crossed the time and I'm sure, uh, you know, Everyone, uh, you'd probably have other appointments in the morning. So any other questions to cover before we conclude? All right, there's a question from Rini. Is ongoing monitoring relevant in terms of KYC AML checks of clients? How, how often do we need to monitor, let's say a client? How often do we need to conduct their checks? Because I, I do know that some, uh, you know, like in law firms, we tend to have like a three year period, but maybe, you know, maybe that's not that's not a one size fits all answer. If I can uh, put sure, an sure. input here quickly, um, I think um, I'm not sure in the UAE at the moment if there is a strict regulatory of the ongoing, let's say, um, uh, frequency of verification of the KYC uh, of the clients in business or corporate services uh, industries. Banking and legal industries are a bit more regulated because obviously they are seen as high risk uh, into that regard. Um, however, usually if the proper research and in-depth research is done at the beginning and we have the full transparency, my personal recommendation would be that um, if you have a contractual of a service engagement that is renewable, let's say on 12 months, every 12 months you have to renew that retainer or that uh, long-term agreement, then do that at least a mini due diligence check every time you have that renewal uh, period coming across. Or if you have an ongoing automatic contract um, in order to protect ourselves and to make sure that we are still uh, in line with, with the standards and regulations, then uh, every 12 months, uh, a general uh, superficial at least uh, background check should, should uh, be executed by the um, companies upon individuals and uh, corporations. And uh, probably an in-depth check, which we, what Mr. Deepak was uh, well explaining earlier, where we go already into the uh, bankruptcy and financial issues and criminal issues, uh, every two to three years would be a, a reasonable uh, period. Because obviously nobody does financial or bankruptcy in 12 uh, days or in a month or two. It takes time to reach out to that decision and then it takes time to authorities in that jurisdiction to declare or to publicly share that information. So an in-depth search maybe uh, systematically or every two or three years would be required. It depends on the industry or the type of the client or the size of the client. However, on uh, renewal of services, probably more regular, superficial, testing uh, and checkups are required uh, to, to maintain that consistency. Got it. And Ahmed, you, uh, any, any thoughts there? Uh, you, you raise your hands. Yeah, I, I think um, the auditors and accountants, by, 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 uh, by just doing their business, they will have always access to, to regular information. So for example, the, who, who are the uh, professions who have to register to go AML, for example, are the accountants, auditors, real estate and uh, businesses trading in uh, precious metals and uh, stones uh, and corporate service providers. We as corporate service providers, are, as lawyers, we get involved in every transaction. So if there is a, an acquisition for another company, opening a new account or uh, any kind of legal document that goes because they're buying properties or selling properties or doing something, we get involved. We see the transactions happening. So this is without even periodically checking and opening the files of the client and check if they are doing everything uh, correct or not, we get involved. So by receiving these inquiries, we have to check it as well as the accountants and auditors because they automatically see the annual records of all their clients. So if they see something suspicious, then they have to um, respond without even going deep into a closed file with no reason to check. By just doing your business, you find out if there is something um, suspicious or not. Yeah, yeah, no, no thanks a lot, Ahmad. We have a question, and I think Mariana, you were probably typing the answer, uh, you know, about accountants and tax consultants, whether they need to register. Um, okay, I think you're on mute. 
But I, well, I guess the right, answer. Yes. So in the Minister of Economy, um, we have clearly stated the category of auditors and accountants as uh, required industry to register. Um, however, when we speak about um, um, the activities in the UAE, this is where the confusion comes. We have the activity accounting and bookkeeping, mm -hmm. which is non-regulated activity, and then we have a tax consultants, VAT consultants, and auditors, which is regulated activities. Um, as per my humble understanding, the tax uh, and VAT consultants activities, as well as auditors, are the activities that are required to register and then just bookkeeping or data entry as soon as you're not advising the client and you're not handling uh, the, the funds or transactions on behalf of the third par uh, parties, you're not seen as, as that category. However, the registration is free of charge. And at the moment, if we don't have clear clarity of separation of those two activities, my personal recommendation is go ahead, uh, complete the form submitted um, and have it you know, declared so then we don't have this uh, later as a, as a reason to be penalized. Uh, it's quick, it takes about uh, a couple of minutes to register and upload the needed uh, copies of documents and it's, uh, it's, it's quite simple. Um, so then why not do it? Yeah. And Zed, do you, uh, I'm sure you have some insights there. Yes, thanks. Uh, it was just to add to what my colleague Mariana said that it's very important at this point that you are able to demonstrate the separation of practice. And oftentimes accountants, uh, in, in this region, we also offer uh, other services such as maybe company formation or, or, or those like. So you very quickly may be transgressing into the territory of corporate service providers or, or, or consultants. So it's very important that uh, we're able to demonstrate either this Chinese wall, which may not often be the case here. Then it's, as Mariana said, very important that you register and in the right way. So yeah, it's just adding to that point. But yes, it is essential whether you're accountants or your profession because the service lines can be very quickly vague. Mm -hmm. no, thanks, thanks, Zed. So we'll take one last question before we close the webinar and I'll pose this question to Deepak. Uh, you know, uh, this is a question from Rajuta. Well, what, what needs to be kept in mind, particularly for banks during EDD? Okay. Oh, um, see there, the, the enhanced due diligence comes in, let's say you're doing it when you're onboarding a client. Um, and that does become important if the exposure of the bank is much higher. So, so there are, it's beyond the financials is, is what we're talking about when we do the EDD, because you've got listed companies, private companies, there's enough regulation and systems in each country to say, you know, you've got to meet these standards of, of your filings. But then it's about all the sort of softer aspects of the relationship of, you know, what other promoter businesses are there. Are they connected in some, are those businesses or family businesses connected to uh, politicians or, or people, unsavory characters, let's say. Um, so, so doing that extra step is very important to look at what other uh, nefarious connections the individuals, the key individuals might have. Then you're also looking at the business as a whole. And, and for example, in India, there's the Kamath Committee and others who've been recommending uh, certain uh, ongoing due diligence. So which is why I said in the beginning, you do a certain amount and then you have to do the regular monitoring. Now there is beyond, uh, so, so I, in a nutshell, what the government is, is recommending is if a bank is dependent on 50% of its balance sheet is dependent on 10 clients, those 10 clients need to be validated, verified, and looked at more regularly in more detail to make sure that there's no more significant defaults or negative reputation on the organization. So in that aspect is where doing a soft skills, soft issues monitoring is very important. For example, looking at high attrition in senior management. Now that's not going to reflect on the books of the company when you do the audit, but then you have the top management team under the board get up and leave. Um, that's a big early warning sign. So I, I think mm -hmm. from that EDD point of view, each of, uh, and there are about a dozen uh, areas there where you, where you do need to study the company and its operations in a manner where you have early warning systems. Uh, but it's important as, as part of your due diligence, but that's an encompassing word, you are looking at things beyond financials, beyond the compliance. Not, I'm not taking away from them. I think they're absolutely critical. But I think keeping an eye on what's happening in the market, 
the issues with their senior people, um, for attrition levels, any new litigation that is being announced, um, being aware of, of a, a, an investigation on the company of any kind. Um, those are the kind of things that need to be looked at as part of your due diligence on the company, at least from, from onboarding as a bank to um, uh, as the relationship continues. Great. No, thanks so much, Deepak, for um, you know for uh, answering that question. Uh, I'm sure very relevant for banks. So I guess I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you at the panel. Thank you, Mariana, Ahmad, Deepak, and Zed for sharing your valuable time. You're all busy people. I know that. So it's thank it's you. just really great when uh, you share your insights with the rest of uh, you know us in the industry as well. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you attendees for, uh, you know, for, for participating in today's webinar. I hope you've learned, uh, I, I hope you found a lot of interesting insights today. So yeah, I look forward to engaging with all of you in the future. Feel free to get in touch with each of the panelists if you want to discuss this further. We're going to continue having uh, events for uh, the Connected Insights. So, you know, would love to, like I said, uh, interact with uh, all of you again in the future. Thank you and have an amazing rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Priyasha. And yeah, uh, yeah. thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. See you. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, my fellow speakers and all the attendees. Yeah. Best wishes. Yeah.